After some very successful webinars and blogs on topics such as the coaching mindsets, the changing landscape of financial planning, and the roles of financial advisors, we realized that the question most advisors ask is how do I attract clients, build my business, and ultimately retain my clients? Now to start this morning's webinar, we thought to start with a little story. Imagine two of your clients, Jane and Jill, talking about their advice experience with you, their financial advisor, and your practice. Jane tells Jill how excited she is about her new Hollot policy. She feels it is the best thing she bought since buying her Louis Vuitton handbag. Jill is as excited about her new Fairtree Unit Trust Fund. She feels it is exactly what she's been looking for. Now remember, I said imagine, because for most clients, the experience they have with an advice business or the process of investing or doing financial planning isn't as exciting or seamless. And this can be for many reasons. The endless paperwork or the many choices we offer the clients. It could be that investing is too personal or too emotional. Some might have had a bad experience growing up with investments or finances or money. Now, have you ever asked yourself, how is my client's life different after going on the journey of financial advice with me? Are they satisfied with the advice experience I deliver? What is the value they get from my advice offering? In order for us to answer these questions, we should perhaps consider the purpose of financial advice. Why do people engage with financial planners? We at Amity Investment Solutions believe that the purpose and ultimately the primary reason clients engage with financial advisors is to help them navigate their financial affairs to get to a state of financial well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tanya Katsia. I'm the Advisor Experience Manager at Amity Investment Solutions and welcome to this morning's webinar. Marissa Marina, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And again, thank you for all the viewers that's attending. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Maurice van der Merwe is the CEO at Amity Investment Solutions and is also a very passionate researcher, especially in the field of financial well-being. Maurice, let's start maybe this morning. How would you describe financial well-being and why do you believe it is important? Tanya, uh, thank you. Yes, um, this is a topic that has gained a lot of uh, attention over the last 10 years. And the focus uh, on it can be attributed to the rise of behavioral finance as a research topic. Um, ever since behavioral scientists like uh, Professor Dina and Seligman started advocating that psychology, economics and social sciences should focus on interventions to help people experience well-being. The topic of people's relationship with money started getting attention. It's also interesting to note that uh, policy makers and regulators around the world has jumped onto this bandwagon and today the mandate of regulators in countries like the UK and Australia has been expanded to include interventions and monitoring of um, people's well-being, financial well-being, um, and that of their citizens. So traditional financial planning has focused primarily on the financial uh, needs of a client. And very few of our processes have been designed to transform financial behavior of the client. Um, so financial well-being can best be described as a state, a condition, let's call it that, wherein a person can meet their current and ongoing financial obligations, um, that they can feel that they are secure in their financial future, 
and are able to make choices that allow them to enjoy life. Um, the research done shows that financial well-being has four dimensions. And given that we're talking about behavioral sciences, I will describe it in terms of emotional experiences, really. So the first one would be where a person uh, needs to feel in control of their month-to-month -month, uh, money, money management um, and also other short-term financial commitments that they have to pay. Secondly, they need to feel safe. So the experience of peace of mind comes to, you know, is, is really what it's about. Knowing that should an emergency arise, that they will be financially okay. The third dimension is then the need to enjoy life. Um, this talks to having uh, the freedom to choose the spending, their spending uh, on things that, that has meaning to them and that gives them joy in life. And then the last dimension uh, talks to the, the need to have hope for the future. Uh, feel that they can maintain their current standard of living or lifestyle, but also have that potential of actually improving that over time. So assisting clients to experience financial well-being is arguably the ultimate value proposition that a financial advisor can deliver to clients. Um, it is interesting to note that when clients are asked what they want from financial advice, financial well-being is often described uh, and emerges in, the, in their answers in some form of way. Um, now, institutions like Vanguard, Morningstar, Behavioral Research, uh, CFI Institute, all of them have done surveys and found that when they ask clients, what do you want and what do you value, most from financial advice, then clients typically come back with answers like the following. Firstly, they would say, I want advice that enables me to have a life well lived. I want advice that helps me to achieve my goals and to understand the context of the solutions that the advisor offered me to, um, in, in the context of how it's going to help me to achieve my goals. Advice that empowers me to make better financial decisions. And I think that word empowerment is very important. So it places the focus on, I don't want you to give me advice. I want to be in control of this, this journey. Mm -hmm. And then also advice that gives me control. And that is a key, key thing for, for us. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, advisors don't have to be scared of technology eating their lunch. You know, whether it's chat GPT or it's robo-advisors or whatever, um, as long as they focus their planning proposition, rather, um, on helping the client put meaning to their money, mm -hmm. they will add value the clients will be willing to pay for. Marina, now you are not just our in-house uh, behavioral scientist and specialist, um, but you yourself are a client and also you're actually a client of one of the advisors within the Amity um, network. Now, why do you think it is relevant uh, for financial advisors to consider this financial well-being approach? Well, Tanya, um, I've actually, like you say, have experienced um, the impact from a financial advisor who follows this approach and how it led me um, to be on the road towards financial well-being. Um, as a psychologist, I know all too well the role that finances play in the well-being of people. But as just another person who also needs to manage her finances on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it adds tremendous value um, to my life to have an advisor that actually empowered me to make better financial decisions, um, to have a sense of control over my financial affairs, um, and who helped me to articulate my financial goals um, and put me in a place where we are both confident we will meet those goals in the medium and the long term. I think from both a personal experience and a professional ex understanding of how behaviors are shifting in our changing world, that advisors seriously need to consider this approach to both get and keep clients. Clients' needs are changing, um, people want more personal advice, more personal experiences, um, and don't just want to be a number, um, 
and like Marius have said, you know, be advised by robo advisors. We all have unique lives. We all have unique circumstances that needs to be accommodated. Um, and advisors who just follows a recipe is probably not going to be that relevant um, in future. Marius, you've spoken before about the research that you've done and that this led to you believing that the ultimate value proposition will be to deliver financial well-being. Um, but to do so would require advisors to fulfill certain roles. And you've mentioned this uh, on one of the previous webinars as well. But maybe let's dive a bit deeper into some of these four roles that will help advisors to not only get more clients, but to ultimately keep those clients. So the first role is the traditional role that we are all fulfilling in, in some way. Um, and that's the one where we are, the one we're f familiar with and being a financial planner. But to my, in my opinion, we need to rethink our financial planning philosophy, our processes, our strategies and the assumptions that we base it on. Um, if the primary goal is to deliver financial well-being, we need to provide a financial plan that facilitates and influences the financial behavior of the client, their capability and their financial composure. Three key sort of drivers of financial well-being. Now the starting point um, for any form of change um, is creating awareness. So from a financial advice perspective, it means the client needs to know the health of their wealth. Um, to be able to understand this, clients need a, an interpreter. And, and financial advisors, therefore, should fulfill the role of financial physician. Um, now, this is a term which Professor Meyer Statman from Santa Clara University in the U.S. used. And, and it's, uh, it's really being the money doctor for the client. Uh, giving a diagnosis of their financial position. And this requires advisors to develop a way of depicting and interpreting the client's current financial position and to help them to get an awareness of the consequences of their financial behavior, their habits, their beliefs, their money beliefs and scripts. Um, so this will inform our understanding of the kind of behaviors that uh, brought the client to this point and what we should be giving attention to in our plan, in our financial plan and sort of highlight for the client as well. It also allows us to create a pers personal benchmark from which we can monitor and measure progress over time. Um, and going forward, which means... Um, which will go a long way, rather, um, in a client's perception of the value of advice that we give as, as advisors um, and, and also influence the relationship that we have with the client over time. Now, the advisor should not only focus on the current, but also helping create a financial vision for the client. And as a planner, advisors need to adapt their planning process to explore the life events um, that may impact this client's life and help them explore values-based goals for the future. Now, this is an important part. Value-based talks to linking the client's goals to those things that are important to them in life, whether it's family issues, whether it's whatever that it may be. And the minute that you link it to that, they become more engaged because now this is their plan. Mm -hmm. It's not a financial plan with financial goals. Mm -hmm. You have to save. Why do I have to save? Putting meaning to that, that action or that behavior makes it more engaging. And that also means that they are more committed to that, mm -hmm. to that goal, or so, sorry, to that, to that plan. Um, so this, this also helps us to create context uh, for recommended uh, financial strategies. Um, People want to know why this specific product, why this for investment strategy, and how is this going to help me to achieve my goal? So um, creating that sort of context for the client helps to, to be more engaged. Um, so the planning process should therefore be more collaborative and more engaging, as I said, 
which will only happen if the plan talks to how it will change the client's life. One of the key things, we, you know, starting points really is for us to say, um, so what, what is the, what's in it for me? And the minute I can make that connection to the financial plan, it becomes more, you know, sort of I'm more motivated to, to stick to it uh, and, and, um, and it influences my decision making obviously as well. And I suppose our topic to get the client, keep the client, will ultimately the keep the client part you mentioned is if this is a collaborative plan, there's a better chance that the client will stick to the plan and stick to the strategy ultimately. But the, Tanya, the collaborative process will also work very well with prospects in the sense that the minute that you place the focus on the other person and not yourself, you know, we, we tend to, as advisors, because we're very analytical, we are, you know, results driven and things like that, we often go into a meeting with a client or a prospect wanting to give solutions. We want to get to the solutions as quickly as possible. Um, but the minute you, you show interest in the client and you are more, you know, to use the term curious about who this person is, mm -hmm. you know, then immediately the, you build rapport with the client. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that establishes trust as well, mm -hmm. which is critical in also getting the clients on board. So, yeah. But Marina, now listening to this role that Marius has defined, um, what do you think is important for an advisor when he or she then takes up this role? I think Marius hit the nail on the head now when he said um, that surely the most important element is to have built trust with a client. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing to open up your financial affairs to someone, um, to give you a diagnosis on it. Um, it is a super vulnerable experience and it definitely was for me. Um, and again, from a personal experience, as well as professional knowledge, I can share how I experienced that first um, engagement with a new person that I had to share, or that I wanted to get advice from. Um, the, my financial advisor really had a client discovery process that was both personal, but highly professional. Um, our first conversation was focused on who I am, where I am in my life and my career, um, you know, and, and that particular circumstances was actually that it was right after COVID, so halfway into COVID in 2020, um, I, I had to move from being highly associated with other consulting companies to being on my own and in my own practice. So the whole way that I created income for myself changed um, and I had to think about how to do that. I was also um, recently divorced so that had a huge impact on how I budget and how I now look at finances um, and and we actually explored that situations first and he wanted to know where I am with what that's in my life and and incorporated that into his plan the second thing he asked me about was what are typically my financial habits you know do I budget do I save um, you know, do I spend, what, what do I like to spend on, you know, what is just my, so I could share with him, you know, you know, I'm usually a very prudent spender, but I don't have particular savings accounts and I, I believe in paying off your debts, you know, so that was like particular financial habits. But I think the, um, the thing that was, was striking to me was that he also shared with me that he is interested in understanding my personality better. Um, so that he would know how to share information with me and how to give me advice. Um, you know, being a psychologist, I was so impressed, <laughs> first of all, um, on the one hand, but also as a person very grateful for someone that wanted to know more about me so that he could tailor how he engages with me. Um, so I shared with him um, you know, and, and fortunately he used um, a behavioral descriptor uh, instrument or just a categorization that, um, you know, that we could immediately calibrate on or knew what we were talking about. And the biggest value for me was that we could immediately start to use a common language between yeah. us um, to describe my typical behaviors um, when it comes to investing and when it comes to beliefs about money. 
and I'll, I would respond based to the advice, you know, the process. Um, for instance, you know, I, I'm a person that likes to have a lot of information before I make a decision. Um, so he, and I could share that with him based on the profile. You know, it wasn't just information that I had to think about and share from my own knowledge. He asked me those questions and I could share, I like to have information before I make a decision. Um, I like things to be structured. I would like to see a bigger picture um, for when we get eventually to a plan. Um, and that gave the trust building between us really a big boost um, because I felt more and more at ease to share the insights out of my financial situation with him because it was not just about the numbers. Um, he, he wanted to understand who I am um, so that he could use that in building the plan. I think the second thing, so, so, so the first thing is trust. And what do you do to build that, like Maria said, the rapport and the trust between um, yourself? I think the second thing um, that is probably as important um, is the quality of the plan um, that you give your client. Now, I thought I had a plan. I had a plan. I had all the um, medical aids and the life insurance and the retirement annuity and the short-term insurance. Um, I still had a plan to start saving into a particular savings account at some point um, because in my, my belief was that it's actually best to just first pay off your home loan yes. um, and not have a separate account because the interest rates, da 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 da, da. Um, So the plan was mostly about how and how much I should pay for what type of products to tick the boxes of a responsible person. Um, the type of plan that I actually got after our third consultation um, with each other was, was a whole different type of plan. Um, I had a comprehensive picture on one page of what the current status is of each of these products, um, but more importantly, how they contribute to the short, the medium and the long-term financial goals that I had to articulate to someone other than myself in my head, of course, because we have the plans in our heads all the time, but we don't have to articulate it to someone. Um, so I had to think about, you know, do I want to buy my children a car mm. when they are finished with school? Uh, am I going to pay for the, the tertiary education? You know, how do I want to save for it? How do I want to finance it? Um, how long are they going to stay with me, you know, after school? How long do I anticipate am I going to be responsible for them? Um, how much do I want to leave there? Because somewhere in there was also the will, yeah. you know, the um, loop into the plan was um, exactly how much I was supposed to pay off on my home loan so that I could add that asset um, at a later stage, mm -hmm. um, but save the extra money I was paying off there somewhere else. Uh, for a short-term goal um, and to add some of that to my retirement planning. So we could look at this plan holistically um, and, and I could see how the different allocations of money would allocate to the different mm -hmm. products which adds up to the bigger goal. Um, and, and for me, who love graphs, he mm -hmm. plotted this for me on a graph <laughs> to see. So knowing again my personality and understanding how I'd like to see information, um, it was really great to, to have someone that could say, okay, so let, let's put it in a graph so that you can see over time how these things are going to come together. Um, but it does seem that, I mean, you mentioned trust now, Marius mentioned trust earlier. Trust is definitely like a key for when you want to get a client and retain a client. But also you mentioned three consultations, so it's not an, just a once-off process. It's definitely something that's, um, I mean, Simon Sinek said that trust happens between meetings. So, I mean, here's, a, here's the proof that it actually happened after consultations. But you don't talk much about products specifically, but, I mean, Marius, where does product fit into the roles then when you, when you consider these four roles? What type of advisor the hat the, do you then wear when you talk about product specific um, functions or? Yeah, I tell you, that's, a, that's the second role um, the advisor will, will keep on playing um, going forward. So the role of financial consultant or advisor then, which means that for this role, the advisor wears the hat of technical expert. 
evaluating different product options um, by showing, for instance, the tax, you know, how can tax be optimized, how the product is ideal for the specific circumstances of the client in terms of the probability of achieving the goal um, and how it can impact the financial well-being during the journey. Um, so as an example, can a specific investment strategy, for instance, reduce the uncertainty of achieving the goal in some way? Um, and what could the return profile of this strategy be like? Um, how does this relate into the client's money profile, their risk capacity, and why is it suitable given the client's financial circumstances? You know, so we so often, if I take myself, you know, in, in the past, I would focus on the requirement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of, you, you just have to do this because this is the way. So the rational sort of thinking of financial planning. And we are not always that, you know, tuned in into thinking about what kind of journey this is going to be for the client, you know, getting to that, that financial outcome. Um, and one of the challenges is it's, it's no use, you know, if, if I have this perfect plan. And we know that, you know, even when it comes to investing, we, don't, we can't predict what the outcome is going to be exactly. Um, and it's no use I predict perfectly what could potentially happen. Um, but the client dies five years earlier because of anxiety, exactly. you know, because he couldn't sleep, it, you know, yeah. and deal yeah. with it. So, so that's why I think this financial well-being really is important from, to, to sort of get our mindset right and focus not only on financial outcomes, the rational. Because we are all irrational people, really, to be honest. We know we should eat right and exercise, but we don't do it, you know. Um, I know where to save, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we know what the right things are yeah. to do from a rational financial planning perspective or a responsible financial behavior, as you mentioned earlier. But we don't necessarily do that. And, and that's really where the key comes in, in to say, so how do, we f how do we develop a plan? How do we position products to get clients to really stick to this strategy as well. Because it's, we all know the whole concept of the behavioral gap, you know. So what's the use we have this brilliant plan, uh, which is financially and rationally perfect, but the client don't stick to it. And these kind of ways of positioning products, of interpreting the implications of the consequences of these products, whether it's from a tax perspective or whatever, will help the client to understand the why um, they need this and, and, and also motivate them then to stick to it. So, mm -hmm. so really with a financial advisor having this, advant this vantage point that they have the, you know, both the know what the destination is and they also know what the roadmap is to get to that destination. And then interpreting that in the context of how suitable these different things are in achieving the desired financial outcome um, and also how it will impact this client's financial well-being is actually a, uh, an ideal position that the advisor can position products from. Marina, did your advisor do some of this and did he implement some of these um, points that Marius now touched on? Tanya, given the fact that my financial plan is one where I can see how the various components fits with and the impact each other, I also consult my financial advisor when it comes to financial year end and taxes payable. I've made the decision twice to move money between accounts to increase my retirement contribution to have the immediate tax benefit. But I also know exactly how it is impacting my savings plan. Um, and my debt reduction plan and how I should therefore adjust spending plans to catch up um, on those. So yes, he, um, he is helping me to see the relationship between the two or well, the few. Um, and something I really appreciated from the start is that he made it clear to me that he is not a product specialist. Um, he was clear about his role being firstly to help me make the plan to get to my financial goals and supporting me to understand which vehicles will make use of, that we will make use of to achieve those plans. But he could connect me to specialists if I needed um, for more information. And he was very open to working with them to support the outcomes we were both working towards. But Marina, it does seem that um, another way of attracting the clients is to be very clear on what you can offer and what you do offer within your business. Mm -hmm. 
and also um, you know your own specialities then as an advisor not to be afraid to upfront state this to to your clients mm -hmm. Maurice, I know you spoke about the advisor's role as um, an administrator or a financial organizer in the past. And um, surely you don't mean now that advisors need to manage the client's financial paperwork. But I mean, there are some, to some ex extent, some administrative burdens as well that the, cl that the advisor faces. Tanya, yes, um, it, it could mean that, um, dependent on the value proposition of the FSP and the service model that you offer clients. So some advisors already, you know, provide tax services um, to clients, which means they already have to do some form of, of financial administration, um, where an FSP provide estate planning, for instance, they already do the will, they provide those kind of services. So, um, but where advisors don't do that, as part of their service model, value can also be added without doing the client's admin per se. Um, for instance, by having a checklist. At your annual review meeting, you go through a checklist and you say, well, is your tax returns, has it been submitted, you know? Um, and, and things like that. Have we revisited the will? Have you updated the will, etc.? Those kind of things create a feeling of control for the client. Even if it's just to sort of, um, remind them or create awareness, oh, I need to do this, you know, I forgot to do this, that kind of thing. Um, that's adding value in some way to the client. Um, so as an advisor that focuses on de delivering financial well-being, you would be aware of the client's financial behaviors and biases, and then you can recommend and implement actions that would reduce the risk of the client's own behavior, derailing the plan. Mm -hmm. And this could be, for instance, um, implementing a debit order, uh, you know, for a savings plan as an example. So if you know this client tends to spend all their money on day one of the month, you know, and you introduce a, 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 a sort of a debit order, mm -hmm. then automatic, something happens automatically, you influence the behavior. It's those habit forming type of things, you know, we must make it easier to, to create that habit for the client. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I think we need to understand that, that organizing a client's finances or is, is a, a very important part of the value that we actually can offer mm -hmm. because it's one of those things, chaos mm -hmm. is, we don't like, nobody likes chaos or very few people, I don't know you, <laughs> maybe you would say that there are people that like it, but, but in general, we, we, need to have, we need to have predictability of some sort um, and that's what, what this helps us with. Mm -hmm. if, if the advisor helps to put those, um, the client, make sure that the client's financial paperwork is in place, um, then, then that, that adds a lot of value as well. Mm -hmm. So Marina, do you feel now that your administration and your financial administration and stuff is now up to date? I mean, did, did, you, did you feel your advisor actually helped you in this process and through this journey now? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, Marius, you mentioned chaos, but we've said before that part of financial well-being is feeling in control mm -hmm. of your finances, you know, so and a feeling of control is often underpinned by some form of order, at least. You know, so definitely um, two things come to mind when I think about how my advisor took up this role. Um, firstly, very prompt and competent conclusion of what I felt like was a gazillion forms that needed to be completed um, to move certain funds and updating of my will. Um, his administrative assistance or oh, assistant was very clear on what and where I needed to complete and when to send it back. Uh, she followed up with me when I did not get to it. Um, and, you know, that helped me a lot to, you know, to just understand which forms, where do I need to sign, what do I need to complete to get it done. Um, and that was a very practical help that I really, really appreciated. Um, a second thing was that he is he was very prompt and still is in checking in with me as per our agreement uh, twice a year, but not even just the twice a year, you know, he would just like ask me, how's it going with the taxes? You know, um, how are you thinking about the additional retirement contribution this year? Um, and, you know, help me to just connect the dots again between what I'm doing on the one hand with taxes and the other one with my retirement funds because it is built into our plan um, how I'm going to to deal with that 
The second thing that I really, really appreciate, and I also see that as part of the administrative support, but also the control part, is that the record that he keeps of our plan, and I'm specifically saying our plan, it's my plan <laughs> that I um, you know, take ownership for, but, but he's keeping a record of that. Um, so when we check in with each other, he can show me exactly on the graphs, where are we now? Um, where am I deviating from the plan? Where am I ahead of the plan? Um, so that I can take that back into my budget and into my everyday decisions. Um, I really appreciate that and it definitely enhanced my own diligence in monitoring my finances with that plan in mind. So in a, in a sense, he equipped you, he enabled you, he even empowered you um, and he collaborated with you on this plan. So would you almost say it's like you, he's like your accountability partner? For sure, <laughs> yes. Accountability partner would be a, a good way of describing it um, and in a, in a very collaborative, in a collaborative way, way. Yes. That yeah. which works for you. Absolutely, yes. Now, the advisor as a financial coach. Now, this is a role that is being punted since the introduction of behavioral finance to the world of financial advice. There are many programs offered by products providers. Um, I mean, we are seeing the CFP moving to this, uh, or including this curriculum of behavioral finance, um, incorporating models on this, the CFA Institute, we mentioned right up front, Morningstar as well. So, but this is a role that many advisors seem to be very cautious about, almost hesitant and reluctant in a sense to adopt this. But I'm not sure, I don't think they always know what it entails and maybe thinking they know uh, or, or they, they might suspect that we imply they should become therapists of some sort. But Morris, maybe now back to the research you've done in terms of the role. How do you see this role in the context of financial well-being? So in my opinion, there will be three different approaches to this role. Um, the first would be advisors that would just say they are happy and successful with their business as is and um, they're not going to be embarking on this journey or this you know, type of value proposition. Um, the second group will want to keep their focus on the financial planning. So that, let's call it the more technical side of things. But enhance the planning process um, and the outcomes of advice Oh, sorry, the, uh, the outcomes and the advice experience, rather, by incorporating elements of coaching. So, for instance, certain skills, whether it's listening or whatever skills, uh, getting a better discovery process and, uh, you know, asking the right questions, the forms, the, the, the format, rather, of the plan they present to the client, or incorporating progress reporting to their annual review meeting, for instance, um, and maybe focusing on more of an educational communication style with a client uh, if you want to empower them, you know, then education is a key. The third group will be the advisors that will incorporate the life planning, you know, full on type of value proposition and build their whole process around that and position themselves as financial coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, each of these approaches will have very different target markets. They will have different remuneration models, most probably and require different types of skills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that I would say those are the key things. That but I then, Maurice, it, doesn't, it does seem that um, if you've built your successful business for the last 20 years, let's say, that when you adopt this certain lifestyle or life-focused type of concepts in your business, that there's no right or wrong. I mean, you could potentially have a blend of some financial planning philosophies at first, don't you, don't you think? Yeah, I think, you know, maybe to start off by answering it this way, you know, financial planning is, is a very rational process, but we as human beings aren't really built to do what we're supposed to do from a financial planning perspective. If you listen to a money psychologist called uh, Brad Plant, for instance, he would say, you know, look at from an anthropology point of view, you know, we were hunters, you know, and you kill the food and you eat the food every day and you share the food with a, with a tribe because otherwise the, the tribe's not going to look after you tomorrow. So, so we as human beings are not built to save. We're not built for the, these kind of modern financial type of um, actions or, or behavior that we, that we require to, to live in this world that we live in now. So we need to have a mind shift from that perspective 
firstly, um, but you're right in saying it's not something that is there's right and wrong. It is really what kind of advisor you want to be. Um, so it must be said that, um, you know, when it comes to this topic, it, it ultimately depends on the value proposition and the kind of value you want to deliver to the client. Um, one thing that I can say is that when you look at the, the research on value propositions and also what we mentioned earlier, what clients expect going forward, um, then, you know, advisors that deliver financial well-being through a comprehensive, behaviorally integrated type of advice proposition um, will be in a position to explain their value yeah. instead of defending their fees. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite powerful. Now, in the previous webinars, you also spoke about adopting a coaching mindset. Marina, actually, you spoke about this now very recently. And in one of our webinars last year, you also mentioned the skills that a coach will typically need. Evaluating the interaction you had with your advisor, um, what observations can you make if you now put your behavioral scientist hat on and not your client hat? What, what would you say? What's the observations that you made and from your point of view? So I think my examples above um, is already telling that um, the coaching approach that my advisor took um, and the positive impact it had and is still having on my holistic and long-term thinking about financial well-being um, and the role I need to play, but also where and how I can make use of his expertise and knowledge to guide me. I suspect that this was a decision he made a long time ago about the type of financial advisor he wants to be, like Marius mentioned. Um, he was also able to articulate that to me very clearly um, in the beginning when we, we had our first meeting. And that was actually what I bought into. Um, it almost goes without saying that I experienced firsthand um, and noticed it from a professional perspective that he practiced probably most of the skills that I talked about in the webinar um, last year, May. He showed authentic client centricity. Um, he moved beyond the traditional topics. He asked me about my life and career and personal context within which the financial plan would have to work. And he also asked good questions. Um, he listened well. He summarized my answers back to me for understanding. Um, and in general, very important, stay curious um, about my progress mm -hmm. on the plan um, instead of telling me what to do, which is also a good thing for my personality. <laughs> <laughs> but Marina, you mentioned right up front about the vulnerable part and was it at any stage for you uncomfortable? I mean, you moved to a new advisor, um, you had to talk about things, personal things. Mm -hmm. So often we hear advisors that would actually say, but do clients really want this? Do they really want to talk about themselves and go into so much depth in their personal lives? Mm -hmm. They don't want to be asked too many personal questions. Mm -hmm. But listening to what you say, it seems like it was the case. Well, I think going back to what Maurice said in terms of advisors choosing how they would like to operate, the same goes for clients. Clients resonate with an advisor. And personally, my, my need as a client was and it's again the type of person that I am, is that I want to see a big picture and how things link up with one another. I want to know, you know, if I tweak this, will it impact that? Or if I make this decision, will it impact that? And I didn't even see or connect the dots. So I think advisors who want to take this route or are interested in taking this route would probably be people that says, I want to connect dots for a client. I, I'm interested in a more holistic, um, systemic approach to financial well-being. I understand that well-being is not just created by one thing. It is actually a few things that lines up to put a, position, a client in a position of financial well-being. And then clients who have that same need will resonate with each other. So you're asking whether I was uncomfortable. Yes, I was uncomfortable. Um, at that point, but I also understood why this information is necessary. And in some way, we were both working towards a goal that, that we both wanted, and therefore I was more willing um, to share that information. And the more I could see how it's used and how it's linked um, 
the more comfortable I became to, to share that information. And I can really say at this point, um, I want to phone him, you know, and, and say, you know, sh is this the right decision to make? I think this is, is it, but can you just line it up for me again, you know, what the impact is going to be? Um, and, and what's the impact going to be on the other um, portions of my, of my financial plan? But Tanya, also, I think, once again, not the right and the wrong way, but if your discovery process allows you to, to discover wh what kind of person this is you're working with, you can tailor the, the planning process to that person. So it allows you to say, well, for this person, we're going to delve a bit deeper. But with this person, I need to take it slow and sort of first build the trust before we go into those deeper questions, you know, things like that. Or maybe never. Some clients may, may not want that, you know. So, but that is what the discovery process and the behavioral side of things is supposed to be doing, is empower you to, to adapt uh, the process or, or tailor, rather, the planning experience for the client. And I hear both of you refer a lot to, it's not necessarily the psychology side, it's the behavioral side. So, and I think that should also be quite important. Now, if we come back to the topic for today of how to get a client and keep a client, it seems that the advisor firstly needs to gain trust um, and perhaps not at the very first meeting, a couple of meetings, um, and then also to be sure that he articulates his value proposition very well. Then speak in a language, like you mentioned, common language, that seems to be very important, and also have a very good client discovery process. Maurice, you just alluded to this now, and also make use of some of the coaching skills that you have spoken to. Uh, fulfill most of the four roles that we are talking to about today. And finally, if I were to summarize what, I've, what I hear now is that if an advisor can enable and equip a client and collaborate on a plan, he will also most, most probably be able not to get the client, but also to keep the client and have the client stick to the plan and the strategy. So Marina, um, would you say your advisor is a financial coach? <laughs> Well, I would say yes and no. Um, a coach in the pure definition would not play the role of a planner and consultant and administrator. Um, you know, in the pure sense of the role, it is someone who really is just th there as the accountability partner and reflection. So he takes on those roles as well, um, which, which would say they know he is not um, a, a, a true coach. But it, he definitely takes a coaching approach and exhibits a coaching mindset um, in that he established an ongoing partnership that helps me toward, to move forward on my financial goals and results that I took ownership of through the process of coaching. Um, I'm deepening my learning um, and improving the quality of my life from a financial perspective um, with his practical support and guidance. Um, and I think the mindset and the willingness to exhibit those skills and practicing them um, is why I would say yes, he has a coaching approach which supports our financial um, advisor relationship. Great, thank you so much Marina. Thank, yeah, thank you for sharing so much of your personal experiences, your personality and maybe it's a good thing. I mean, now you've recently joined uh, or you're part of the Amity team and we've sent out that official communication, but I mean, it's good. So so the clients can also get to know a bit more about the, <laughs> our behavioral, uh, behavioral psychologists and financial specialists. We actually don't have a proper term, I realize, for, <laughs> for you. Uh, but thank you for joining us this morning. Marius, thank you. Um, I mean, there has been a lot of research going on. For those of you who would know, Marius is busy with doing a uh, master's. Uh, and this, I think, also helps a bit for someone who has this research type of personality. But thank you both for really showing an interest in financial well-being and to, to really take out this topic um, to the network out there and for the insights that you've shared today. And I hope we planted a seed with some of the advisors on the call this morning to say that if you, are, if you want to engage, if you want to know more, please share your thoughts with us. You all know where to get hold of us and let's keep the conversation going. I think that is, that's really the most important thing. So thank you so much, guys, and thank you for everyone attending this morning. We'll see you on our next monthly webinar.